which takes us to item eight, and that is the Auckland Unitary Plan um, submissions on four private plan changes to date at Drury. Um, our principal policy analyst for this and report author is Christopher uh, Turbot. Now, Christopher's got a, a short uh, presentation, and we'll have a look at that. Christopher, are you with us? Uh, Marina, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Christopher. Do you have a, if, if at all possible, oh, you've got a presentation, so um, yeah. if, uh, if when the presentation is not there, if you can activate your camera, that would be great. Okay, you're going to take us through the presentation um, in your hands, Christopher. Yes, so uh, no, I think Duncan's running the, running the slideshow. Thank you. So this presentation is about four private plan changes in Drury that were lodged on the 27th of August 2020. Uh, the committees had a previous agenda item back in July about that notification process. Uh, all the documents for those plan changes are on the website now, so it includes Plan Change 40K, Drury Centre Precinct, uh, Plan Change 49, Drury East Precinct, Plan Change 50, Wai Hoi Hoi, Plan Change 51, Drury 2. Uh, collectively, the four private plan changes propose urban zoning of about 365 hectares of the Drury Future Urban Area, so it's quite a substantial area. And they're all clustered around the existing State Highway 1 Drury Interchange, uh, focused around various arterial roads and highways there. Next page, please. So this is a quick summary of the Drury Centre plan change. There's a large 35 hectare metropolitan centre proposed, close to that state one route. And that's shown in a sort of purpley colour in the presentation. And there's a 51 and a half hectare mixed use zone surrounding that, and that provides for residential and business activities. That's shown in a sort of lavender mauve colour. And then open space is proposed adjoining the Hanaya stream. The next page, please. This is the Drury East plan change, which sits beside the Drury Centre plan change. It's a, got a residential focus with a gradation of residential intensity uh, going downwards towards the east. So there's terraced housing, mixed housing, urban zoning, mixed housing, suburban, plus a mixed use zone here. It's intended to provide for a centre. Next page, please. Uh, PC50 is the Wai Hoi Hoi plan change. That is located next to the centre, but to the north. It is 49 hectares of terraced housing apartment building zoning. Next page, please. So this is PC48, 49 and 50 together. State Ho one is shown in the red line and the other major Roads are Great South Road and Karaka Road, also known as State Highway 22. And you can see these changes provide a package with a centre and new residential development alongside. And they're all located at the east of State Highway 1. Uh, next page, please. So this is PC51 Drury 2. It is located just to the west of State Highway 1. That's Karaka Road, uh, labelled as State Highway 22 there, and that feeds up to State Highway 1 at uh, the top right-hand corner of the map. So this is a somewhat smaller, but still similar plan change, 4.6 hectares of mixed housing urban, nearly 14 hectares of terraced housing apartments, and 15 hectare town centre. Next page, please. So this is just to take you back to the Council's Drury Orpaheke Structure Plan 2019. And to provide context, these plan changes fill in the centre component around that State Highway 1 interchange there. Uh, next page, please. So this uh, next part of the presentation talks about why we should present Council submissions. Um, 
It needs to be noted there's a broad high level similarity between the land uses proposed in the four plan changes and those proposed in the council structure plan. And indeed the plan change documentation does rely on the council structure plan to a fair degree. Now, having said that, nevertheless, staff analysis indicates that there are seven issues that the council should make submissions on. The next page, please. And these issues are summarised in the agenda item and they are summarised more briefly here. Uh, infrastructure funding, timing and location is a critical issue for the council, but also for some of the other infrastructure providers. Uh, there is simply not enough money to provide for the infrastructure required for these plan changes and it will take time to build that infrastructure even once money is found for it. In addition to that central and critical issue, there's some other issues which are more about the details of the plan changes, but they're still nevertheless important. Uh, we think there are sort of land use and transport integration issues, including zoning, density and walkability near public transport that should be addressed. Uh, the water plan changes have stored management plans with them, but once again, there are some of the details of those that we think need to be improved to provide for the outcomes sought in the Council's RPS and also the National Policy Statement on water. There was also some points we think need to be made about open space provision, issues of similar to mana fenera, and provision for notable trees. And then there's a number of other sort of technical matters to do with the rules and zones and providing for a quality built environment. So that's a very quick summary. There's a bit more information on the agenda item. Uh, next page, please. So our recommendation is that the Council make submissions on the plan changes addressing the matters list above and that a subgroup be appointed to approve the Council's submissions on those plan changes. And if the Council decides to make submissions, it needs to do, by, do so by the 22nd of October 2020. So uh, that's a reasonably tight time frame. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Christopher. Now, members, um, we did signal that we were very likely to make a submission on this, so we, we don't have the submission before us, and the intention is to delegate authority to look at that. So you might like to cast your mind um, to the possibility of inclu including the Papakura Local Board Chair. If that was the case, we would, I would suggest that we would have to extend that then to the Franklin Local Board Chair as well. But I'm not jumping to that conclusion. There's just some small changes there in the motions. But um, just to round out um, um, the, the, the discussion that we're having, I have invited um, Jacques Victor, the General Manager of Auckland Plan um, and Strategy, to be on the call, and John Dunshea, uh, who's the General Manager from the DPO, the Development Programme Office, is with us in the room. Um, the critical issue you can see on a slide, uh, maybe we could go back to that slide with a summary of issues, please, Duncan. The critical issue which Christopher acknowledges um, in his uh, presentation here today, this is the critical issue. It's the top bullet point, infrastructure funding, timing and location. Um, and I invite questions of Christopher, um, Jacques Victor, or John Dunshea um, on the presentation here and the paper. Councillor Cooper at the outset, please. Thank you, Christopher. Um, my question is really, I mean, absolutely support putting forward a submission on these elements. My question is, how does um, a plan change going ahead of the unitary plan in terms of becoming a live zone affect current live zones that currently don't even have, uh, we don't even have funding for infrastructure. Um, I, I guess that's a question, but also just I, are we, uh, under the RMA, can that be no noted or, or, or brought up um, about the regional impact of funding for infrastructure in our submission? Is that for you, Christopher, or would you 
like to defer to John Dunshay on that. Well, I think I can probably cover the initial component and then we can defer to John regarding the actual sort of quantum of the, of the size of the issue. So yes, these plan changes will uh, affect the whole of Auckland in the sense there's not enough money to provide for them and the rest of Auckland and all the other growth pressures that Auckland is facing. And yes, as an issue we can include in the submission. The submission doesn't need a lot of detailed evidence in it because that will come at the hearing, but we do need to make the submission to provide scope. And perhaps John can answer any questions about the overall effect on Auckland. John Dutchie. Um, I, I can't do any detail other than other than to um, so confirm that yes, part of the part of the evidence that will be submitted will be um, the uh, impact of um, funding infrastructure, not only on um, Drury but on the wider Auckland. So there will be a structured approach, and the, the final level of that will be uh, not only does funding of uh, is there a problem with funding infrastructure in Drury, but the implications of that, that there will be a problem with funding infrastructure across uh, wider Auckland and that therefore mitigation has to be um, found that would enable us um, to cash flow that in an appropriate way that wouldn't be able to, that wouldn't have such a uh, significant effect on Drury and then Auckland. Just a supplementary, if you don't mind, Mr Chair. Um, so in terms of who decides the priorities when you've already got live zone greenfields, for example, Red Hills, um, which was a surprise to us and we're still trying to play catch up, um, how is then the funding prioritised? How, so if you suddenly have something like this coming online, who makes that decision as to what happens? Because my fear is that already zoned areas then miss out and delay development and we go to the new next new shiny thing. So I guess it's like who makes that decision. Thank you. Who would you go? So um, it's a very good question, um, <laughs> which is probably why it was asked. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so um, yes, it is a political decision. Uh, and um, you know, Jacques on the, the call and others, but um, in order to be able to, my view would be that in order to be able to make that decision, you need to know what the um, um, what cards you have and what the, what the issues and and uh, are, and what the uh, requirements are for funding um, across Auckland are. Uh, and this is a much wider issue, it's not just Auckland, it's probably wider than that in the fact that the tools we have through the RMA make it difficult for us to do that um, kind of planning. We either have an RPS or an MPS and then we go straight down to um, resource, uh, resource consents. It's very difficult for the resource consents team to uh, manage um, developers who can't develop their 500 houses because they have to put in a $20 million, um, we have to put in a $20 million junction and we don't have the $20 million, uh, but, um, uh, and, and it's just very difficult, but then the, the, we are probably not mature enough, not just in Auckland, but elsewhere in terms of that RPS and MPS stuff and thinking about how you, take a more strategic view about uh, allocation of uh, funding to uh, growth. But there are other people on the call who probably have a, a more informed view than I. Mr Chair, it's Megan here. If I could just add, uh, so just to follow on from John, uh, it is an LTP discussion that you will be having. You, you have started that in terms of the, the levers, those tools that you have across the board. Uh, whether you have enough, and even if the ones you have, how you want to pull those or use those, uh, and it, it will also come through um, the you know the land transport plan, uh, all of those other options about where we package and spend our money, um, and the decisions you'll make over the coming nine months. I reserve my right to speak. Thank you. And just to, I could add on John. that that is actually building on what Megan was said. That actually is going to be part of the. 
the uh, evidence that's going to be put forward at Drury is it's going to be referencing the, LT, you know, the RPS, the NPS and the LTP and RLTP and where we sit with that. So a lot of the discussion will be about that kind of stuff. Thank you, John. Thank you, Megan. And um, look, I think some of the um, answers to the questions that councillors might be putting forward uh, could be answered from uh, John Dunshay uh, from the DPO or, or Jacques Victor um, heading up our strategy unit or, or Christopher or Megan. So uh, for those that are on the line, that those that I've just named, um, please uh, signal that you uh, are, um, are willing to respond to the questions put. I'll go now to Councillor Simpson, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I've got a, a, a few short questions. Um, my first question is, how long will members of the Planning Committee have to check the draft submission and provide input to those who make the final submission? What's tight mean? But, um, I might go to Chief of Strategy on... Chris, uh, Chris, Christopher Turbot. Chris, can you answer um, Councillor Simpson's question, please? What's the turnaround time? I know it's going to be tight, but uh, I've suggested in our agenda run through that we do circulate this to all the members of this committee. Christopher? Christopher, we can't hear you at the moment. Okay, I will go to Chief of Strategy. Sorry, sorry, I'm here now. We, we are. Christopher, sorry did you hear that. the question? Uh, my suggestion is as soon as the subcommittee is appointed that we present them with a draft submission or submissions plural and if they're happy with those then we circulate them as soon as possible to the whole of the committee and that uh, we really need that back so it can be signed off you know preferably a couple of days before the 22nd of October so I'm not even sure what day of the week the 22nd is but um, we need to be able to lodge those on a working day before the 22nd of October. Mr Chair, my question was just to make sure that the members of the planning committee had a few working days to actually read the submission and have their, well, I mean, we've got a pretty tight work schedule, as you're aware, and I just wanted to make sure that there was, you know, you weren't asking somebody on a Monday to have come back on a Tuesday, you know, make mm. sure they had a reasonable time frame. That was my first question. Can, um, I just come, can I just build on your question, please? Now, there's been a suggestion, uh, a request from uh, the chair of the Papakura board to, to be named there. I think it's more appropriate that we we could circulate it to the Papakura and Franklin boards as we're circulating it to the planning committee members, but I would be of a mind to retain the named uh, councillors and IMSB members as those that are delegated authority to sign it off. Would Can I just get a signal from members on that course? Anybody online that's not in the room, is there a view, just briefly? Okay, I'll just, is that a question, Councillor Mulholland, related to, to... So, yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, related to that. Yeah. So, um, members, elected members, will still be informed and kept um, abroad of what's happening and be able to have input. Is that correct? The, the draft submission... Yes. Uh, ...once the delegated um, members have seen it and made an initial sign-off, it will be shared Correct. with the members of the planning committee and the respective <coughs> local boards that I've just named. Great, thank you. But the delegated sign-off remains with the, um, the members of this committee. Okay, back to Councillor Simpson, please. Thank you. My second question uh, and third question come um, with the report uh, items 33 and 34. Um, and I'm just concerned with the sentence uh, that says evidence for the hearings may place pressure on existing budgets if necessary, a report will be prepared for Finance and Performance Com Committee on this matter. I just want um, assurance that these people are talking to finance because there is very little elasticity in our budgets. And with respect, um, I'm hoping that you're not going to come to finance and performance with some more money. I'm just saying, stating the obvious here, you know, so can you try and get the evidence within budget would be a request. Mr Chair, I'd be happy to respond. Yes, of course. Um, I guess I just wanted to be really open about 
the um, the level of expertise and time we will need, um, including legal, for example, um, may well be considerable. This is a very important set of submissions. The intention is not to ask for any more money. It clearly is not. I guess I just wanted to be open, similar to you, um, to say that it will it, it will put pressure on budgets. And I just wanted to signal that if we needed to, we would talk to you first. But if we needed to, we would need to come back to a committee. But that is not the intention. That's nice to hear. Thank you. But my next question is probably the biggest one. And that is, um, point 34 says there are significant, um, potentially address the significant infrastructure funding and financing implications of these pri private plan changes. What do you understand to be significant infrastructure funding and financial financing implications? John, can I ask you to give some numbers there and then I could round off if needed? Um, some of the, some, the initial work we've done, and it's very high level, and it's at a P50, but it's a P50 was that there is a, is a full build out. So that's a full build out. So this is over 20 plus years. There's a billion dollar, uh, there's a need to find a billion dollars in order to, um, uh, for, the, for infrastructure. Now, part of the process that we have to go through with the developers and what we are seeking through the um, hearings process is how we um, mitigate that and phase that in a way that means that that billion dollars is, is um, uh, cash flowed in a way that means that our funding and financing constraints, particularly in the next five years, are not detrimentally affected, and that's the evidence we will be putting. As I've said, the evidence will be on the basis that if we look at our long-term plan and our RLTP, and if we look at the requirements of the NPS and the RPS, then we don't have the ability to fund this infrastructure, and therefore uh, these um, uh, plan changes need to be structured or phased or um, have triggers, whatever, put in in a, in a way that means that that infrastructure can be provided because we will have the funding at some stage, or the developers will pay for it, or we use an infrastructure financing and funding levy. The second option was the best one. <laughs> and that is what we will be. Uh, and that is what we will be seeking. Um, the developers have a different view. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, if you didn't quite hear that, John did say a billion dollars, and that's an approximate over the phasing, phase development areas. Uh, as a, at a full build-out. With the full build-out. So it just gives you an idea of, um, of some costs that we're looking at. I think I saw the Chair of uh, Finance and Performance lean back in the chair when she heard that number. All right, I, li I like the way he was going to fund it, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Simpson, further question? Complete. Councillor Dalton, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my questioning is around the same lines as Councillor Cooper and Simpson. Um, so we put in the submissions, and I support the points around the submissions, and it is around the cost of infrastructure, open space, all of those things. What, what, how does that influence the decision on a plan change? Does it, or is it simply an opportunity for us to discuss um, those points that we have through the hearings to achieve an outcome to mitigate the cost of to council? Uh, would you like me to address that question? Thank or? you, Christopher. So the, the submission uh, provides an opportunity to put those issues in front of the independent hearing panel. And we're proposing that there be one hearing panel to address all of these plan changes at once, um, so they get an integrated outcome. So the evidence would we put forward would address those issues. Uh, but prior to that, we would expect to be a fair amount of time for negotiation with the applicants and with other interested parties to see if we could resolve some of these issues beforehand. Perhaps just a supplementary, Chair. My yes. question will be, uh, have we put in submissions before 
along this um, line uh, is not been possibly not being able to fund the infrastructure. Um, have we done that before, and has that affected the outcome of a plan change being approved or not? Christopher? I was just trying to think, this, these issues have arisen before in the context of the Red Hills area, and that was through the Auckland Unitary Plan process. Um, I ha haven't myself been involved in one of these, so I can't give you um, a complete answer on that. Um, but I know it has been an issue in other plan change processes, and it hasn't always been resolved to the council's satisfaction, but this is the one avenue we've got to actually to address the issue. There's no other mechanism other than by making a submission. Um, Councillor Dalton, it's Megan here. If I could just uh, add to that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, look, the, the first... Uh, the first time you, you get an opportunity to get involved in these um, uh, processes is through a submission. So the, the importance of the submission is that it provides you scope to then go into the hearing and discuss uh, all the matters that are important to you. And as Christopher said, we, we will work through that process. We may well work to try and resolve some of them, but it's clear that some of them will not be resolved um, until the hearing. And so the, the fundamentally important part here is not so much the detail of the submission, but that we get those points across so that we can then speak to them in the hearing. Uh, in terms of the uh, have we done it before? Yes, we have. Um, in the in the first um, jury plan change on Charles Maher in the west of Jury, we put a, a submission in, uh, and funding was a part of that. And Smales Farm also funding was kind of part of that submission. So we've done it before. Um, it, it is a, it is appropriate. We are able to do that. Uh, and for us, the fundamental opportunity is for us to be able to get our foot in the door and then and then work through that process uh, at the hearing and provide the evidence we need. Can I just add to that in the fact that uh, in response to that question, uh, the other thing that I would say is that there is um, uh, probably at least a year and probably three years' work that has gone into Drury in terms of understanding the infrastructure that is required and the cost of that infrastructure. So uh, given um, how young Auckland as a region is, that always, and hasn't, that always hasn't been possible, I don't think, and I may be wrong. But in this case, I think there's been an enormous amount of work that has been done uh, over the last period, and that's been done by um, Supporting Growth Alliance, uh, by AT, uh, by Watercare, um, to some extent by Healthy Waters as well, um, by Parks, um, AC if I haven't referred to it, and there is a lot of information out there already. So. Supporting what uh, Megan said, there will be a body of evidence that we will be able to present to the hearings panel for them to consider. And in addition to that, going again back to what Megan said earlier, um, we will also be able to present evidence on the uh, position where we, we, we are in with respect to the long-term plan and the RLTP because that will have been um, worked through and discussed to a large extent by that state anyway. So some of the evidence that will be submitted will be along the lines of where we sit with our RLTP and our LTP. So there will be uh, a lot of evidence to support the case that we make. Thank you, John. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. Deputy Mayor, please, question. Thanks, Chris. And actually, Vic Mr. Dunshay's already answered the question I was going to ask was, what is the full build out time? And Mr. Dunshay said it's you know, 20, 25, potentially even 30 years. So the, although there is a infrastructure shortfall, John, uh, over the length of this project, there is potential for that shortfall to be filled up um, given its intergenerational capacities. Yes, and that's right at the, right at the heart of the discussions of the hearings panel is, um, you know, the, um, this area falls in the, in the uh, uh, fuzz uh, and uh, was anticipated to be developed. The, the issue we have at the moment is about is about timing to a certain extent, as we've talked about before, um, because of NZ up and other things that's been uh, brought forward. Uh, and so our discussions will be uh, when we talk with the developers and present the evidence at the hearings panel will be how we mitigate uh, the upfront costs and the cash flow problems we have uh, by um, phasing the development in 
uh, a way that enables those cash flow problems to be mitigated and, as, as I've said before, how we get the developers to uh, meet some of the cost. So that's how we'll do it. Uh, and um, it is a, a, there is a, a timing issue here. Thank you, John. Councillor Hills, please. Yeah, I guess my um, questions are similar to, to others, and I guess, and I'm happy to hear the responses so far, but I guess how honest can we be, because um, we obviously don't have the complete projections for the RLTP and the 10-year um, budget, but it's clear, you know, we are behind so far on current infrastructure and replacing old infrastructure, such as, you know, we've got a lot coming up um, in the water space for the 10-year budget too, uh, everyone wanting large projects. How do we how do we finally get it truthfully out there that we just we just don't have the budget here? There, there we're not talking tens of millions. We we're talking billions. How, how do we put that through so that there's certainty for the developers, there's certainty for the community, um, you know, about what's available? The other thing is, uh, and it's only mentioned. Um, briefly in the climate impact statement, but what information and what data will you be will we be using for the submissions on uh, climate? So you know, taking up all that rural land and also the you know long term. Yes, I know the plan for Drury is to have an integrated development where everyone lives and works together, but we know that's never worked in Auckland. Um, and in the short term, medium term, as we're seeing in the northwest. Um, this huge amount of driving around to different parts of the city because the jobs aren't there yet, the houses are there before the jobs and the public transport is almost non-existent. We can't even get um, intersections upgraded in that area, let alone uh, public transport, which is affecting the north, the northwest and the west. So I guess how are we going to have that really clear in the submissions about climate change and, and money, um, which, you know, we kind of keep kidding ourselves that we can do this. Could I come in first and then Megan might want to come in and then Christopher. Yes, so just turning on the the, um, the money side, so um, uh, to some extent you're, you're correct, Councillor, but I actually think again, as I said earlier, we're in a different position now. As Megan has said, there'll have been a lot of work done on the long-term plan and the RLTP and also ATAP, which will be able to provide a significant amount of information in relation to the position we are with our uh, infrastructure and our funding. Uh, a part of the evidence that goes toward that will be will be evidence we have already got and we have built up from a from quite a granular level um, around uh, infrastructure in some and Drury is the obvious example. We've I've referred to the work we've done there. We've done a lot of work in the northwest where we understand the costs. We've done a lot of work in some of the brownfield areas where we understand the costs. So I think there will, we will be able to um, leave the hearings panel in no doubt that we have, um, that, that, that infrastructure is required, uh, what infrastructure is required and where it's required and how much it's going to cost. It's not going to be completely comprehensive, but the, I don't think the hearings panel will be left in any doubt that there is an issue there. Um, I'll leave, um, I'm not sure if, I'll leave Christopher to answer the other question around um, climate change, though I will say that part of the evidence that is given around the phasing and funding will be linked to the LTP and the RLTP and the LTP and the Local Government Act and things and the fact that what we are trying to where, what we are trying to achieve here is a fully integrated community with jobs and homes and community facilities uh, with proper uh, infrastructure phased in a way that supports people's well-being and I think some of the some of the writ work I've already done actually uses those that kinds of terminology terminology and that will be some of the evidence that we'll be presenting in that funding and phasing work um, because we need the funding in order to ensure that we can achieve that, and that's what we're required to do by the legislation and by the policy statements. Um, and uh, Megan may want to add to that, and Christopher. Thanks, John. I'll just I'll follow on. Look, um, the climate change question is a good one, and 
it, 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 I think it connects in, entirely with the funding one as well because, because as John said, we want to have a, an integrated community uh, that is public transport led in the sense that you know the public transport comes sooner rather than later. That exactly equates to some of the infrastructure funding issues we have. If we didn't bother doing that, then we probably wouldn't have such an issue at this particular point in time. But the way in which we want to see this develop, um, both in the near term and over this 20, 30 years, um, means that we do need that infrastructure, um, that building and integrating in the right way, uh, and that leads to, um, to, to infrastructure funding, both social and, and physical hard structure uh, as well. So it is all linked. Um, there's a little bit of detail, although climate change isn't specifically kind of listed as a term, um, but in the report in Paris 18 and 19 in particular, um, are around the ultimate outcomes we want to achieve um, with this community. Thank you, Megan. And um, Councillor Hills, do you have anything further there? Have you addressed your questions? No, that was fine. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chair, Councillor Bartley, please. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just wanted to know, like, I fully appreciate the discussions about the impact on... Uh, the rest of the region regarding infrastructure needs because I'm going to be broken record here and talk about Tamaki and the $800 million infrastructure bill over there for that um, development um, that's still chugging along. But I wanted to know, like... Um, is there, what is the, is there, are we like setting ourselves up to be sued by developers because we're unable to um, meet our side of it? It doesn't sound like the hearings panel can say, no, the development can't go ahead because the council's got no money. So it's going to go ahead and it's all about mitigation and staging. And what if we can't come to the party? Where are we? Are we going to be sued? Is that going to cost the ratepayer more money? Through the chair, I... Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, the hearing panel absolutely can say no. So um, on any of these matters and or any, anything else that, um, that others bring up with, within the Resource Management Act context. So uh, it's not a done deal. Uh, I, it, it's, I think it's pretty clear which, whichever way the panel goes, the matter will go to court because somebody somewhere won't be happy. So um, if you talk about, that's not the same as suing, but it, but it, it is uh, a nature of the process that it will go through the courts. And so pro ultimately, I think the courts will make the decision on this, uh, whichever way it goes. Um, we're not in any position. We don't believe we're giving you any advice or setting you up in any way at the moment for legal risk beyond the normal Resource Management Act processes, that's not a legal risk, it's just a legal reality of how this thing goes, th goes through. But if there are any risks coming through, we will clearly talk with you about that. Um, but So, yeah, there's no legal risk in that sense, but there is a legal reality of how these things move through, and I expect it to go through that process over the coming years. So there are... Uh, the, the courts that are being referred to are the Environment Court and possibly, you know, a higher court on ju judicial review matters. So any, the applicant can do that or any submitter. That's why it's important for council to be a submitter and to be part of the process. Um, that's what we're here to discuss. So um, further questions, Councillor Bartley? Um, actually, it was for uh, councillors. Um, as a member on the subgroup. I just wanted to know if any councillors were averse to any of the um, main points of the submission, and I don't hear it yet, so I guess we're on a good steer so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mayor Goff, please. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Yeah, um, obviously we don't have the, the full submission yet, but the, uh, the areas outlined, I think, are the important ones, and the critical one is infrastructure funding and financing. I've just got a, um, a couple of questions here. I, I think um, Megan has answered the questions that I had on climate change, uh, how that's being addressed. Um, my, my, my other questions are these. Um, how is our submission going to address the need to lock developers uh, into committing to build the housing uh, if the council and the government 
is putting the infrastructure in place, and how does the how how have things developed from the uh, uncertainty around the impact of COVID nineteen on this? But mainly, how how will we seek in that submission to say if we're going to put money into this, we're not going to put money into infrastructure that the developers won't build on for a number of years. We need them to build as we create the infrastructure. Uh, otherwise, um, we've got a, a a white elephant sitting there. How do we address that in the submission? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, John Dunshay? So Christopher might want to come in here, or Megan, but um, I suppose the answer to that is the way that we phase the uh, infrastructure means that in development, we will try and get the hearings panel to agree to triggers or some other mechanism that ensures that uh, housing cannot take place until infrastructure will in Yes, I'm just trying to. I'm getting confused here. Yeah. So no, Other it's, way around. It's, it's just the yeah, that the um, uh, infrastructure uh, needs to be provided before the housing takes place, and until that infrastructure is uh, provided, the housing can't be developed. Uh, but at the same time, we need to ensure that the housing is developed once the infrastructure is provided. So we, we're working through triggers and uh, mechanisms that ensure that those are tight and it is phased step by step. So as the Minister said, uh, we don't have infrastructure that is isolated and we have uh, development that follows infrastructure. So right at the heart of what we will be doing is working through um, how we can phase the development to ensure that um, the two go together. Have we revised the um, the the outlook post COVID nineteen? We were originally really concerned when we looked at this that um, you know we're going to do all of this, but hey, COVID nineteen may bring construction to a grinding halt. Uh, figures don't tend to suggest that that's happening. In fact, our resource consents are at a record level. But have we done the work to? Uh, to, to you know, see if there is a case that there is the demand for this land being developed at this point. Uh, not to date, we haven't. No, that I'm aware. And there's somebody, Megan. Uh, not specifically, as I'm aware, but but in broad terms, you're right. There is still a lot of construction going on, but I do think. Uh, that due to things like wage subsidies and other things that have obviously happened over the last six months, um, there will be difficulties in the coming months and some, I'm sure, companies and individuals um, may find things harder than, you know, than, than it was a year ago. So it, it is still uncertain, uh, but that, and that is obviously part of a commercial cycle and will, we will have to see what happens with the COVID situation with any further lockdowns um, and, God forbid, anything worse. Um, so, look, I think there is real uncertainty there. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not confident that COVID um, won't have an impact uh, and that we won't see that for some, for some years, I suspect. Thank you. Um, in terms of trying to maximise the developer's contribution towards the cost of this infrastructure, which will be substantial, uh, to what extent are you able to do that through the submission or is that through um, behind the scenes negotiations with the, the contractors and uh, to, with the developers? It's negotiation. <clears throat> so we, the, you know, it is referenced in the, the issues are referenced in the submissions. Um, and the reasons why and the mitigation that might be sought. But when it comes right down to it, the way that we influence and ensure that that happens is to negotiate with the uh, developers and to try and reach uh, agreement prior to the hearings about how that um, they will come to the party in terms of funding through agreement or some sort, sort of levy or through phasing. Um, and then uh, where we can't reach agreement, uh, or where we reach agreement, we can present that as evidence at the hearings to uh, show that that has to the panel that that has already been mitigated. Where we haven't been able to reach agreement, then we can present that evidence to the hearings panel as well, showing that this is something that needs to be taken into account uh, because this still remains an issue. And the hearings panel, panel, and then we will provide further evidence on how we think it should be mitigated, uh, notwithstanding lack of agreement with the developers, and leave the and the hearings panel will have to make a decision on that. Uh, thank, thanks, John. Look, my, my other question is around the question of sequencing that uh, Linda Cooper raised and, uh, and others have raised as well. I mean, the reason that we are 
the, the, the first of all, the the area that is that, that the private private uh, plans relate to uh, is identified already as um, development ready, isn't it? But we're bringing it forward in some cases from 2028 to 2022. But was this investment that we would um, we would actually be ob obliged to put in anyway, given the fact that this uh, this has been treated by the council as development ready land? I don't. I mean, I'm not sure what the the uh, future development land would be the word I would use, uh, and that's. Um, but I'll let Megan come in on that. And the other thing is that yes, there is a timing issue here. So this was identified for development, particularly the land to the east, but that wasn't due for till 2028, and therefore a lot of the infrastructure and funding work that has gone assumed that uh, that would be uh, take place uh, later in this decade rather than now. Um, so. That's, I'm not sure if there's anything Megan wants to answer. Um, can, can I maybe just put it more specifically to you, Megan, then, given the fact that we've identified, Council has identified this land as development ready, what obligation does that create for us in terms of uh, provision of infrastructure? Uh, it doesn't identify it as development uh, ready. It, it, it shows over a 30-year period that this area will be developed. There were some parts of it that were to be development ready, like now, um, and that, and some of that is the um, land to the west. And as John Dunshay said, uh, some of these uh, plan changes and decisions are bringing forward the need for the land to be development ready. So there's never a question that it would be developed. The question is when. Uh, so, so in order for the development to occur it does then put the onus on us to provide the infrastructure to allow that. And that's, of course, where we get into the questions about who pays, how we pay, what levers have you got to pull, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the negotiations with developers. So it's because the timing is different um, is, is the particular difficulty we have at the moment. So it's, it's bringing forward the provision of infrastructure, in some cases, what, by as much as uh, five years? Or more, 15, yeah. 15. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, just in terms of uh, um, how we how we face the, the the submission and 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 how we how we would fund this, um, presumably the transport um, funding is going to be part of uh, the current Auckland Transport Alignment uh, program. Is that uh, that's where that's where the funding will be set out for our contribution to infrastructure? Uh, so both yes. Oh. Okay. So both uh, sorry no. both um, both ATAP, the RLTP, which is the Regional Land Transport Plan, uh, and the Long Term Plan as well for for the broader range of infrastructure, not just transport. Because it's not just yes. um, transport. There is a no uh, no no. I appreciate that. Yeah, but, but but the biggest the biggest item there will be transport, won't it, John? Uh, it Biggest will cost. Be, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It, it definitely is. Um, uh, but the the public open space, community facilities, and stormwater uh, in the medium term are, are not insignificant. Yeah, yeah, no, appreciate it. Um, the, the the challenge we've got then, just to correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that as we negotiate ATAP to find funding uh, for uh, for this. Um, the pressure that will be put on us is the fact that government is putting in what uh, 2.4 billion into transport infrastructure for um, for the Drury subdivision, and they're probably relieving us of what is it three or four hundred million dollars that we've already committed under ATAP to provide things like like Mill Road. Um, so the, the the difficulty that we face if we were to say no. Um, <laughs> we're just not going to have anything to do with this. Um, the, the answer would be that the government would not reach an agreement on ATAP, having made that commitment and having picked up um, commitments that we've already made under ATAP to fund things like Mill Road. That that creates the context in which um, we we show willingness or not willingness uh, to to proceed with any funding of infrastructure in this area, doesn't it? Yes, and look, that's why um, 
at the previous meeting where, or a couple of meetings ago, where these plan changes came to you for consideration, our, our advice is that notwithstanding how difficult this might be or even the merits of it, um, you know, in the RMA context, um, we believe we have to accept it. But this is the opportunity to, to get into the nitty gritty and actually work out how this could happen uh, and by whom and when. Okay, thanks very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Goff. And Mayor Goff, I just want to um, come back to you. Um, you did mention this this question of um, you know, market viability. Are you suggesting that we need to maybe bring some evidence, um, some market economics evidence in our submission? I, I would uh, probably support yeah. you on that. Yeah, I think I think if we're they're going to go ahead and um, provide some significant funding in this area, uh, we need to know that the developers are going to be in a position uh, to meet their side of the bargain. Uh, and you know, I, I, I was actually more worried before than I have been since I've seen what's the impact on resource uh, uh, building consensus has been in, in the last month and the month before that. Uh, but I think it would be useful um, to uh, talk again with David Norman about um, what the, the likely um, impact of COVID-19 on latest information might be on the, uh, on the on the need for this land to be developed and the prospect of um, there being a market for the houses that are built uh, when the infrastructure is in place. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so Christopher and John and Jacques will take that into account. Um, it might uh, extend past um, our own chief economist to an an economist or appropriately skilled person that can bring some um, market economics um, evidence to our submission and the future hearing. Thank you, Mayor Goff. Uh, some, some of the bank economists, Mr Chair, might be able to help with that, Westpac, ASB, et cetera. Um, they, they've been making a lot of comments. They've done the work. So I think if we approach them, they would, they would share their forecasts with us. That might be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and then that person needs to go in front of a hearing as well. So we need to make sure that they've got the right credentials, etc. So um, can we have Councillor Coombe, please? Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. The first one was we heard from Chair Catchpole, and I just wondered if there was any response to the issues that he raised. And I, if I understand it correctly, he was concerned about the having competing metropolitan centres and the impact on the work that they've been doing? Now, I'm not sure whether Christopher was on the line or John Dunche was in the room. Um, well, I, I, I did hear it, uh, so I could probably respond. So this is Christopher speaking. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Christopher. So the Existing Papakura Centre is owned as a metropolitan centre uh, for st historical reasons. Uh, when that decision was made at that stage, there was no proposal for additional centres further to the south, and the future urban zone was just a piece of yellow zoning in the plan. Uh, since then, a lot of work has been done on how that land could be developed in the catchment that it could serve in terms of the population catchment. And the economic analysis has been brought to bear both from the applicants and also from the council's economists indicates that a large centre is required to service that catchment. And in that context, the evidence is pointing towards that centre being of a scale similar to a metro centre scale centre. So that's where the evidence is sort of pointing at the present time. Okay, thank, um, thank, uh, you. Uh, yeah. thank you, Christopher. I had a second question. Thank, thank you. Councillor Kim. Um, and I think, well, the Deputy Mayor here, I think, summed that up saying it's not, it's in addition rather than instead of, <laughs> um, if that's what I understood correctly, um, in response to that, my first question. But the second question goes to the climate impact statement. I know there's been some previous comments on this, but this is probably a question to Megan, just about in terms of what we're trying to capture in this statement, it's around the impact. And those impacts go far beyond just 
how the new residents are going to travel to and from their new development. It's you know got implications across the region. And I just wonder, are we getting to a point now that we're sort of a year into having these climate impact statements where we will really actually document the, the impacts so we can understand the trade-offs, like exactly what we're talking about in terms of increased emissions as a result of greenfield developments. And it's not about being judgy about it, it's just about so we can really understand in terms of our prioritisation, our regional planning, um, and really understand what we mean about a climate impact. Because I just feel this is sort of touched on one little part of the picture. And if we're really, you know, going forward, I just feel that we, we're, these impact statements are just not really cutting it. Thanks, Councillor Coombe. Look, I accept that. Uh, and absolutely, we will get better at this because it is... Um, it is complex and hard to do. I think certainly for the submission, and I'll leave it with, with Chris and John uh, to ensure that we um, we have something or, or appropriately speak around that in the submission and would be interested in your thoughts, obviously, when you get to see that um, and your feedback before we put that in. Um, I think also, and, and you will have heard this from Alec and the team as well, um, for emissions, things like transport and and the land use, um, you know, density, the way in which we, we use our land and form our communities are two massively important parts of reducing our emissions. So um, that is critical to what this development is. Uh, so it will absolutely have an impact, either negatively or positively. But it is quite difficult to, um, to probably calculate that in, in the way in which, you're, in which you want, but we are working on that. So please let us know when you see the submission what your thoughts are around that in particular. Thank you, and it'll be good going forward. And yeah, We definitely need to get better at that and get real about it. And um, Councillor Kerr, I invite you to work with the Chief of Sustainability. You know, maybe they just start auditing some of the um, climate impact statements um, and test them. And if they don't stack up, let the respective committee chairs know. Um, we need to sharpen up there. Thank you. Um, now, I've got one final question. I'll take one final question, please, from Councillor Hills, and then I think we'll go to comments straight after that. Councillor Hills, one more. Uh, yeah, just a question. It was probably to the Mayor's point, and I think the the conversation about it doesn't match with ATAP on Mill Road, et cetera, well, it, it actually doesn't match uh, because we we only had phase one about uh, less than a third of the budget at the end of ATAP. So I guess that needs to be considered that we you know, didn't exactly vote at the time uh, to have this whole project moved forward. So I guess um, it needs to be taken into consideration in the submission that actually we weren't planning for this development um, as early as it is happening now. It wasn't an ATAP, it was a phase one at the very end of ATAP. So I'm not saying if that's good or bad, but I'm just saying that we must, you know, our current ATAP does not say that um, until we change that. So just wanted to point that out. Thanks, Councillor Hills. Yes, um, that's a good point. We'll ensure that's in the submission. And also you're probably aware ATAP is being reviewed. So there's an opportunity now for us to uh, to ensure that uh, as far as, as much as we know now, the, f the funding is in the right places, but that's part of the big conversation you'll be having over the coming months. And for those that um, aren't aware of what phase one, phase two is, so in ATAP 2018, it showed phase one, which w was funded, uh, was from Readout Road into the back of Takanini. Um, so it didn't show the project running all the way down in the f in the first decade. Um, so there is that point being made by Councillor Hills that was under the 2018 ATAP. Okay, we'll go now to comments. Uh, Councillor Cooper, with you first, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, what I want to helicopter out about is about the effect on the regional infrastructure and I think, um, you know, if you look at some of the go live that went in our own unitary plan, whether we liked it or not, that is our plan. And I feel a little bit 
and, and there's not a lot we can do about it other than a really strong submission. In terms of prioritising infrastructure, to me, it should be our own plans that go first. Um, because they've already been agreed on, that they've been had a whole independent panel, and then we've adopted them. And then we get held to ransom for private plan changes, basically saying, no, you need to do that because I want to make a profit over here. And I think that's where the system isn't right. Um, but also talking about funding, and I acknowledge our, to my left here, um, no, no, not often, but if I, if I went the other way around the table, she would be on my right, um, is that, um, you know, when we look at a, an infrastructure plan and then trying to go into LTP discussions and trying to unpack all of those different elements of infrastructure, there was a bit over here with stormwater, there's a bit over here with, with water care, there's a bit over here with transport, and that's where it's hard to get the picture for me as a councillor, because it's like an encyclopedia and often these things get missed and before you know it, you're in the final phases and you're suddenly voting for something, for some infrastructure that's going way ahead of already partly developed um, de developments that are in our plan. And that's what concerns me. So I think it was um, Christopher and also John Dunche talking about having some sort of map where we can be able to look at it and go, right, in this area, this is what we're going to need and this is the phasing where we think it's the right way to do it. Because I think that helps inform us. We're not the experts on infrastructure, but we have to make the final decisions to reflect the plan we have. And when we have private plan changes, and I'm not anti it because I will vote for it, people need their right to go through a proper process but we get caught and held to ransom. And even with government plans as well. And so there's almost a bit of blackmail. I'll pay for this if you pay for that. And often we're having to bring a whole lot of stuff forward that never would actually, doesn't work for us. So I think that that's my concerns and I hope that in some way we can um, reflect that in our submission, but also helping us further down the track, which is not that far down the track, by by June, end of June next year, we'll have had to adopt an LTP that tries to reflect us catch up. And I just want to give one example before I finish. Red Hills went live in 2016, and I had the developers who had every right to build houses there ringing me and going, we're going to help to pay for our bit of the road, but AT say they've got no money to actually connect this internal part of our development onto the existing arterial roads. And we had to scamper and struggle and try to sort that out. And I still don't think it's fully, this is two or three years ago, still not fully resolved. And so we'll have houses and people living them without the infrastructure that's really the, 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 the optimum infrastructure. So I think, um, and I do acknowledge our staff are trying to work on that, but that's the sort of muddle we get into and the struggle we get into trying to provide money, um, let alone dumping this on the top. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Very clear. Councillor Cashmore, please. Thank you, Mr Chair, fellow councillors. Um, you know Drury's in my patch. State Highway 1 goes through there. Kiwi Rail goes through there. State Highway 22, come, Pookie comes in and terminates there. The gas line goes through there. The high density power goes through there. And what's going there at the moment is huge amounts of employment. So the Kiwi Properties Potential Retail Centre, 6,000 jobs. Stevenson, 6,000 jobs. There's 20,000 jobs being created around Pukekohe and Ramarama area as we speak. So existing businesses in the Franklin area are having a great deal of confidence to grow and expand. Not only is this development a Todd, it's an employment-based development. People won't be commuting, as they do in the west or from the shore, to any great degree, because there will be employment in the area, largely. I had the privilege on Tuesday to um, open some social houses, Kiwi-built houses, that um, Charles Ma, who many of you have met when he's presented here before, developed 47 houses, all sold within a matter of weeks, being occupied by school teachers, police, 
and other worthy families within the communities. Drury is already happening. What we are in the middle of here is a process. We are giving our staff permission to make a submission to the hearings panel. That's all we're doing. We're not trying to relitigate the private plan changes. We are merely part of the process to let the staff formulate a submission and expose and show up some of the difficulties and challenges that are before this council with the funding of the critical infrastructure. Now, that's absolutely the right thing to do. Absolutely the right thing to do. The government puts put in 2.4 billion, as the mayor has said, into Mill Road, into electrification, into new rail stations, and some other upgrades. There's probably another billion to do. For instance, if we had an infrastructure finding, funding and finance agreement put in place over these developments, 23,000 houses times $1,000 a year comes to $575 million over the time of the development. And if it was over 30 years, it's $690 million. So there's these tools and instruments to help solve this problem. We as a council have got a very difficult habit of saying no to things because um, it doesn't feel comfortable. We are still 40,000 houses short. This particular area in South Auckland is going to be an economic powerhouse of employment and of enterprise because it is in that location of that golden triangle, Hamilton, Auckland, Tauranga. It is like an epicentre of it. Mark Franklin, who is the chair of Stevenson's development, told me the other day that $140 million worth of property has been sold there for commercial development right now. <coughs> 140 million. That's a heck of a good start and shows confidence from the private sector. So I'm really in favour of we proceed with this. I really want Mr. Dugood, Mr. Dan Shea and, um, and Chris to write up a really good submission, em emphasising and showing the gaps and shortfalls and what they see as solutions to go before the independent hearing commissioners. That's a positive move forward and it helps us combine and embrace with the government their investment to deliver for this community in South Auckland, which, as I have said before, is going to be an economic powerhouse to rival Manukau and even the city centre. So thank you, Mr Chair. Let's proceed with it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Henderson, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, and yes, in, in speaking in support of this, uh, and also just noting uh, the Deputy Mayor's comments, that we are talking about a submission here, um, rather than relitigating the whole thing. Um, I just want to agree briefly with Councillor Cooper's points, which I think were very well made. Um, we're talking about a submission, and I have some thoughts to put forward for that process. So with this, we're talking about a full picture, and I've heard that mentioned a few different times. Um, and that involves funding that we would be hard-pressed to provide before COVID, and we're going to find a big struggle now. Um, and so I like these suggestions that I'm hearing around moving costs into other bodies, looking at things in a more flexible way. Because coming from West Auckland, I know very well how hard it is to fund infrastructure. Um, we're going to be facing more choppy waters ahead in this sort of thing. Um, but I want to talk about in particular climate change and the implications here uh, and the emissions created from green zone development and living. I, we can no longer justify building and locking in future emissions and actually raising our emissions profile. So we have to get things like public transport happening before the moving trucks arrive rather than after. I do have one issue with that slide then, therefore, and that's climate change. And, and a lot of those points, it talks around it, but I'd like us to name climate change as an issue. I'd like us to give it its full attention and to look at the emissions profiles as part of the submission. Um, just briefly as well, uh, regard, regarding the points raised, I do need to talk about prioritisation, and I want to talk about Westgate briefly and acknowledge the excellent corridor from Councillor Bartley to on Tamaki, which is another, another challenge. Thanks for raising that. Uh, in Westgate, we have a town centre built now. It's shiny and new. It's built partially with the promise of housing and rapid transit, and Red, Ho Red Hills is already live zoned. So all the business has gone in and the housing and the infrastructure is lagging behind. We already have traffic issues there. It's already there with the current residents. We have a huge housing crisis in Waitakere, huge wait lists for housing New Zealand houses. We only have, for example, one swimming pool for 250,000 people. We've got huge challenges there and infrastructure costs money. I just wanted to point out to everybody that when we're talking about prioritisation, there are places that are already there waiting for this stuff as well. We've got to think about this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Henderson. And now, Councillor Dalton, please. Thank you, Chair. And I support um, Councillor Cooper. She made some really good points um, just around our understanding of what this means for the long-term plan, um, how we prioritise, but our allocation was um, input as well. And so what that tells me is that having all the information as a decision maker is absolutely critical. And to get the, the balance around the, the number of jobs that are coming in, the houses, um, all, all of it, that the Drury structure plan is actually, is important for all councillors to, to be aware of. Um, the prioritisation is an issue. Um, I listened to councillors Bartley and Henderson about existing projects and how we're going to continue to invest. Um, so it is about finding that funding mechanism that is the key in the submission. I support all of the points on the submission. Um, finding that, that funding key is the key to enabling this to go forward so it can deliver on exactly the things that Councillor Cashmore has spoken around. Um, I would just note in the submission it is not capturing the points made by the Papakura Local Board Chair and his concerns around Papakura um, being a metropolitan city and not getting support in terms of what they're trying to deliver and I note that you are going to ensure that they have input into the submission and we would all need to agree that um, we're aligned uh, once we agree on that submission. So, um, Chair, just support for the submission, conscious of the prioritisation. It's not just the initial infrastructure for us, it's going to be the consequential OPEX as we continue to maintain the roads and the healthy waters and everything that goes into how we continue to uh, renew and repair the assets that are being built there from the original capex, wherever that comes from. Um, so in support of the submission, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And um, calling Meg off, please. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair, and um, <clears throat> along with the, the Deputy Mayor and, and Councillor Dalton, um, I support the submission uh, and I support the, the development. Um, the development is, is consistent with our structure plan and, and that's critically important. And we've already identified, as we can read in, in, the, uh, in our report uh, under, under Section 13, that it has been identified as development ready. I just want to touch on the greenfield versus brownfield argument. Um, <clears throat> um, in our Auckland Unity, Unitary plan and in my own commitments when I got first elected, um, the, the principle was accepted that the city needs to go up and out, that we need the quality compact urban form, um, but just relying on brownfields development alone won't be sufficient given the growth that we've got. Um, the, the other thing that I just want to make clear, um, it's, it's not a question of brownfields being a whole lot more cheap. Um, you know, we're putting as many people into Mount Roskill and Mungary as we will into Drury, uh, and we'll, we'll be paying, you know, the government will be paying the price, actually, we hope, of a, um, a, a rapid transit network, probably a light rail, to, to service those areas. Climate change is a consideration, um, but as Megan has said, this is a, a transport, uh, a, a transit-oriented development. Uh, it's going to be public transport-led. There will be an integrated community here. The government's going to build a big hospital out there servicing the region. The schools are going in. Uh, there's industrial areas going in. There's recreation and retail areas going in. So it's not a case of building a Pocono where you, you build the houses and you don't put anything with it. The, the critical issue, um, two critical issues, one is the concept of partnership with government. And we are, we are bound to have a partnership with, with, with government because they provide the, the, the bulk of the funding, two to one, uh, for the Auckland Transport Alignment Project. And they are putting two and a half billion um, through the uh, New Zealand Upgrade Program into this. And they are picking up the commitments that we've already entered into from 2025 uh, for the construction of Mill Road, not to mention, uh, of course, Penlink. But look, funding is critical. And I share the concern of every other councillor on this call. And I've been pretty forthright in saying to the minister and the government 
that um, there are constraints on what we can contribute towards the cost of this development, which means that you know we need to use the submission process um, to promote as much as possible alternative ways of funding uh, what will go in here by way of infrastructure. And that will mean um, under Infrastructure Funding and Financing Act, the use of uh, uh, SPVs. It will mean trying to get as much money as we can from the developers, um, but you know, let's let's not ignore the fact that we will need to make a contribution, as we do in every development project across the city, uh, to make sure that this can happen. So, you know, the idea of this submission is to to highlight um, those needs. It's to also to lock in the private sector, so that if the infrastructure is built, they are locked into providing the houses as the infrastructure is built because you can't afford to have stranded infrastructure, and that's going to be a critical part, uh, from my point of view, in, in, in what we end up here. Um, so thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. The, the last thing I want to say about this is that I think it will, judging from what has been built already out there, we are going to look at a quality development. Um, you know, nobody that's been out and looked around there, and I think the Deputy Mayor was there quite recently, other than thinks, well, they've put a lot of time and effort into producing a quality development here, which is also relatively intensive and more intensive around the, the transit and more intensive around the planned town centres. So, um, yeah, I support the submission uh, and, you know, obviously would like to have a look at that too before it's finalised. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Councillor Hills, please. Hey, thanks, Chair. Of course, obviously supporting the direction of the submission, I guess my, my concerns are uh, already obvious around funding and climate change and just want that strengthened in the submission as much as possible. Just, you know, I I worry that we're making um, or pretending like we're not making the similar mistakes the city has made for decades. I look at council, you know, 2025 we talk about, well, I've been on the council now for four years and I've heard Councillor Cooper say the same things about the western and northwest um, issues there for four years, and we're finally getting a partial busway, you know, investment there, kind of. Um, so, you know, my my I have huge concerns that we can't or we need to be more honest about our shortfalls. Either people have to pay a lot more, or we have to change the way we're doing things. I also have concerns about what immigration is going to look like in the next couple of years and if we should be focusing more intensive before we um, allow this. Yes, this is not decision making right here, but our submission needs to be clear about the impacts. Um, yes, it's fantastic to have an integrated development where everything is close by, but in our current communities, we know that doesn't happen. We have families who who get an affordable house somewhere but work on the other side of the city. We have their kids go into universities on the other side of the city. We have, you know, whether you're a, a nurse or a teacher, you get moved around, or whether you're working in construction, you're driving, ex, you know, extreme distances with all your tools to work somewhere else. That's how the city works. It's not going to be a bubble city where people only stay within. And ATAP 2018 even said that, you know, only 20% of the new... Um, population in the south is being picked up by public transport and there will be significant congestion and traffic calls. So, you know, we, we, we obviously celebrate the great benefits and I, you know, support um, Deputy Mayor's passion and all the work that's been done, but we just have to be really honest about what this will continue to cause our city when other areas like the northwest, the west, and as we've seen the last couple of weeks, the North Shore as well. You know, the Waka Kotahi's mistake of telling everyone to go State Highway 18, 16 to, to help prevent traffic on State Highway. State Highway 1 was a failure. That was terrible for the shore and especially the West who had their trip times tripled um, because of the lack of easy access to the city. So, yeah, I'm really concerned about climate change and the fact that the emergency budget has shown us more than ever that we just don't have the money for our current infrastructure or uh, maintaining our current infrastructure. And um, and I wonder how long that's going to last or how we flip the coin completely to ensure that we do fund communities and transport and water properly. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Uh, Councillor Walker, please. 
just have a a comment to make about um, climate change and emissions. We have a real opportunity here because this is a, I wouldn't say standalone, but it's a clearly greenfield development. So we have an opportunity to look at this overall development and assess what the emissions are. That's across transport, it's also across um, water, um, energy, a whole range of things. So I would like to know as to whether or not that is going to happen because as other people have mentioned, like um, uh, Richard Hills and, and others, uh, I think uh, Pippa Coombe as well, what is happening here is going to lock in emissions for decades to come. Quite clearly, if this um, development is going to lock in a significant number of uh, emissions, then we've got a real problem, because if we can't deal with it here, then where can we deal with it? So my... Um, uh, comment, uh, Mr. Chair, is is our submission process going to reflect that so we have an idea of what the net emissions are from this development? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker, and thanks for your questions and examination of this issue, members, uh, your comments here today. Um, this is um, an, enorm an enormous opportunity uh, and it's an enormous challenge as well. Uh, so the Deputy Mayor's outlined the opportunity, but this submission is, is probably addressing the challenge that we actually now have face to realise the opportunity. And that cannot be realised without hinging back uh, the costs of this and where it's been articulated today of at least a billion dollars. Now, that is the big question before us. It is the not the million dollar question, it's the billion dollar question. So we've had the free money from government, and uh, the big question there is, is the free money from government going to cost the people of Auckland a fortune, or is it going to be hinged back to the main beneficiary, the multiple developers? That, I think, is the key question. Um, I would like to add, and I think councillors have covered this, but I want to reiterate again, the free money that we might uh, applaud um, 2.4 billion in the Southern Corridor, uh, Pen Link, can't remember the number, um, Skypath, and maybe Light Rail in the future, Puhoi to Wellsford, or Puhoi to Walkworth Motorway, they all come with consequential local expenditure demands. And we need to start asking the question when government, through our relationships, and, I, and I'm not uh, I'm not criticising any government that might have come forward with these uh, cap high capital projects uh, and their contributions there. We need to understand at the outset, we need to be asking the questions ourselves at that time, what is the consequential spend? Because we're coming to this too late and this is a bad pattern of Auckland Council. We need to be asking those questions at the outset. So I know that when there was lobbying in favour of Mill Road, the New Zealand, up, New Zealand Upgrade Program package of 2.4, we were not asking those questions. We are being obliged to ask those questions now. How do we pay for it? And it is a billion dollar payment. So that is the crux of the issue before us here. It's not about you know, the qualities of uh, being public transport led or employment or anything like that, that sits in its own right. It's a question of how it is paid for. I would suggest that the benefits that accrue to the private plan change proposers are going to have to be examined here and an infrastructure and financing plan that we've never contemplated before um, really is the priority source, the anchor source of, of funding here. Uh, because there is high risk, as Councillor Henderson, others, I could list the number of councillors, Councillor Cooper, are reminding us that the regional, uh, risk, our regional responsibilities that we've already signed up to uh, are at risk here. These are communities that we've, we've gone through democratically socialised plans and communities have high anticipation. They know COVID is with us and they know there's a new constraint but they don't expect a constraint of a redirection 
to the south of, uh, of the public funding that they were anticipating to be a reason why their uh, projects, the, the development of infrastructure, be it community or transport or water, in their areas is put on the back burner. So um, let's ensure that Council's public purse is actually not subsidising um, the private developer benefits here. There will be some overlay because of, you know, the, there will be um, some benefit in the wider catchment beyond these pr uh, private plan change boundaries, but um, the significant benefit is within the boundary. So enormous challenge here, members. Um, it's a billion dollar challenge, and we've never faced anything quite like that uh, in a private plan change that's come before us. One thing I would like to add is, and probably a message to Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, you're, you'll be responsible with your committee, your regulatory committee for appointed commissioners. Um, no, no, not anymore. We've changed our policy, so our se very senior staff will do that now. It's, okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. I think we are going to have to, the staff now, will have to be giving very careful thought, and I'm sure it's in consultation with you as chair, uh, to the commissioners that we appoint here. We are probably going to have to look at um, maybe going beyond the commissioner um, accreditation list, looking for somebody with some infrastructure funding and financing experience. Um, I actually think this is this task is an enormous task. Um, it's four plan changes now. I understand there are also notices of requirement coming, possibly some other private plan changes. It will take an elected member out of their core responsibility. Uh, it, it, in my view, it just does need to be some um, highly skilled uh, commissioners capable of doing this work over quite a, what's looking like quite a long period. Um, but that would be my plea to Councillor Cooper and the staff that we keep a close eye on the um, expertise that we uh, bring to this commissioner, um, the commissioners that will be listening to this uh, hearing. So. Thank you for all the contributions today. Um, the Chief of Strategy um, and our other staff, uh, John Dunshay, Christopher Turbot and, and Jacques Victor behind the scenes for all your contributions on this enormous challenge. It's a billion dollar challenge at this time and it could be more. So we'll go to the vote and uh, the motions are there. I will move it. Do I have a second, please? Yeah. Um, Councillor Cashmore. <laughs> And uh, I'll put this to the vote now. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. And declare that carried. Thank you. Thank you, members. Now, I think we need to take a five-minute break. It's going to be a short... We're live. I, have a I think I had a question from Councillor Bartley, was it? We're having a five-minute cupcake break. I'm sorry to the members that are online. It will be a cupcake-less break for you. We're back in five. <laughs>